Uh, the Old Testament reading is from the Psalms, because I was studying this last night. The psalm is either a literary or a musical term, poem or song. I don't exactly know. This is a psalm of Asaph. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. I'm living translation today. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your eyes to what I am saying, your ears to what I am saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Stories we have heard and known. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them even the children not yet born. And they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. The word of God for the people of God. Matthew uh, 25, verses 1 through 13. This is the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The five who were foolish did not take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look! The bridegroom is coming! Come out and meet him! And all the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went with in with him went, went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. And he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. The word of God for the people. Thanks, Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be accepting and pleasing in your sight this day. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. How many of you have seen a movie recently at the theater, not just at home? A few? A few? Yeah. Well, Steph and I just went and saw a movie, and by the way, we went down uh, in the spring, and they have this new movie theater called the Iron Horse Bistro, and they have some real good food there, so we got a big, big Sprite, it was a little scary how big it was, but it was a big Sprite, and we got uh, a side of, of buffalo, uh, boneless buffalo wings, and they were really, really good, and we got to see uh, the movie The Murder of the Orient Express, and it was a very interesting movie, and it was just a fun place to go. How many of us like to go to the movies? Like to go? Yeah, I like to go to the movies. Stuff does not, but I like to go to the movies. Yeah, what are some of the best movies that you have ever seen in theaters? Not not this year, just in your whole lifetime. What is the best movie you've seen in a theater? It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life. Titanic. Titanic. Yes, and my parents made me go and see it five times. <laughs> yes, Robert. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Which one, though? All three of them. All three of them. Okay, that's a good answer. I have another hand over here. Did I? Yes. Gone with the wind. Gone with the wind, okay. Yes. The Snoopy movie. I think Steph might have been the Peanuts movie, yes. Yeah. She, I, I, I went to a class actually up here at Countryside my first year in ministry, and I... Steph came along with me, and I dropped her off at Montage Mountain so she could go shopping. But the class went for three hours, so she went over, went over and saw the movie at the theater there. Uh, but it's a great movie if you haven't seen it yet. Yes, Lord. Um, only the great. Okay. Yeah, the 
So, oh, yes. Forrest Gump. Oh, Forrest Gump. All right, well, that's a good one to end on. I really like that one, too. There's a lot of great movies out there, isn't there? A lot of really great movies, very creative people who have put them together, and, and then we get to enjoy them, not just in theaters, but for our whole lifetime, and it's pretty awesome. <coughs> With any movie, there's a lot of thought that goes into it, that has to go into it, in order to take the audience from the beginning of the film to an end of the film. Because usually films are what? Like a couple hours, maybe two, maybe two and a half hours. But they jam a lot of information in to such a short period of time. And it has to make sense. Because when it doesn't make sense, we know, don't we? Yeah. There are many different ways in which screenwriters and producers and directors will design a movie, whether it's to spill the beans early and tell you everything that you need to know, tell you everything that's going on, and use the rest of the movie to just simply explore how it came about. Or you have those movies that leave us as the audience in suspense throughout the entire film, only to throw that twist in at the very, very end that no one was expecting. For the first kind, think of something like Star Wars. How many of us have seen a Star Wars movie before? A few of us? Okay. Well, that's good. Because they're my favorite movies, so there you go. Uh, they always start off the movie with that rolling text, right? That goes from the front of the screen and just kind of floats off into space. And for those of us who are uh, willing to sit there and read all of it, it gives you a lot of good information on the setup of the movie and just what's going on at that time. It helps you to introduce that first scene where you're going to meet both the bad guys and the good guys in that very similar fashion with the big ship coming over top with the over top of the, the planet with the shadow going down on the planet. And so in th those kinds of movies, you pretty much know what's going on right off the bat. And so then the rest of the movie, they explore how they get through all of these struggles that they've already told you about at the very beginning. For the second type of movie, you might be thinking of movies like from someone like M. Night Shyamalan. How many of us have seen an M. Night Shyamalan movie before? How many of us know who M. Night Shyamalan is? Not a clue? Okay, well, some of the movies that you might have thought about would be like The Sixth Sense is a movie that he made. And so with The Sixth Sense, not to spoil anything, but I guess if you were going to see the movie, you would have already seen it since it came out like almost 20 years ago now. They give you, uh, they don't really give you a lot of that backstory, right? They don't give you a lot of context to what's going on. And at the end of the movie, they have that little twist where you find out that Bruce Willis, the main character, has been dead the entire movie. Even though you've been watching him and had no idea. So if you haven't seen the movie, I apologize, but I really don't apologize that much. You should have seen it by now. We all know the twist is coming with a director like that. But so, still, often, it takes us by surprise what that twist actually is. For us as churchgoers, our story of faith is more like that first kind of movie. We have the structure and the understanding of what's going on in our story. We know who the players are. We have the insight into what happened in the past and understanding what happened in the past. But we also have insight into what the future may look like, or may hold. This passage today even gives us an illusion of this image of the life that is come after, or the end times. The biblical narrative is clear that all of us may, must one day return to the, the Creator who made us in one way or another. Now, we may try our very best to write our own endings, write our own stories, but ultimately, we will all return to that creator in this world's that first place. Yet, for us, the question still remains as to how all of this, this understanding of what this world works, how it works, what it looks like, how this will all come about in the end. How will this world be brought to that final point in our lives. It's understandable that we would have this question, but at the same time, this passage 
gives us insight and helps us to better frame our role within this whole thing that we call life. As Jesus says in Matthew 24, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. We may want to know more about these end times, but this is part of the mystery of God that we just simply do not know. And even Scripture tells us that we are not going to have that full understanding. So I think that it would be fair to say that we shouldn't really worry about it too much. We shouldn't spend too much of our time and our energy and the life that we have worrying about what this end time may look like. What's going to come when Christ returns. How God may enact that justice. Or how God may not enact that justice. But rather, I think that we should simply use these examples as ways in which we can better understand what it means to live the Christian faith. This passage shows that these, these young women are awaiting this bridegroom, right? They are awaiting him because he said that he would be coming back to them. He didn't tell them, you'll find out. He told them that he would be coming back. So they know that, for sure. This is a beautiful illustration of what the end times may feel like for us. It sheds light on what is coming in the end before we reach that end. We have these women who are waiting for this bridegroom. The fact that they are waiting is not going to bring the bridegroom, but the bridegroom would be coming one way or the other. And we know this because he said that he would be coming. Jesus has promised us that he would return. Jesus has promised us a paradise to come. Jesus promised his disciples that he would come back one day and take them and all of us with him to be in that paradise. Can I get an amen? amen. That's good news. That's hope. And that's hope that we can share with the broken world. He told on the man on the cross next to him that he would be with him in paradise. Christ promised us a life that is free of the pains and the sufferings and the divisions of this world where we live in life abundant with him and with each other. And we can have faith in this because when Christ went to that cross and he died, he didn't remain that way, but was raised in spirit again. Like us, the virgins in our passage, the women in our passage, have been invited to come and see. They've been invited into this beautiful new world, this new relationship with Christ, and have been promised that they would see this along with all the rest of us in humanity. And so they are responding to that invitation that was given. The struggle that we see in this passage is the human side of these women. They have not come out to meet the bridegroom because they see something miraculous that is happening. The passage says that they went out to meet the bridegroom. They felt like they could dictate when this would happen, and my assumption, since Christ has not even returned to this day, that they would have been pretty disappointed, right? They went out to meet him, and he wasn't there. They would have been disappointed because Christ is not always there to meet us in the ways that we seek Christ to meet us. Though that's the point of faith. Is the point of faith for our God to pander to our own needs and desires that we can get them at the time and place when we want them? Or is the point of faith to know that our God is going to meet our needs and desires in time?
we may not see Christ return in our lifetime. And so we have to consider how then we are going to respond. Paul believed, as many in the old Middle Eastern times did, in biblical times, that Christ was going to return in their mortal lifetime. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we are, are alive, that, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means perceive those who have died. For the Lord himself will cry of command, with the archangel's call and with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. This passage pretty clearly shows that Paul believed that Christ was coming back in his lifetime. Paul had no belief that any of us would be here today. Well, we all know that you are, right? We're all sitting in this room together. So what do we make of that? What do we do with that? Though it didn't happen in his lifetime, we can learn something from how Paul chose to live faithfully anyway. Paul remained focused on the mission which Christ had given him in this world. He didn't lose faith because he wasn't seeing Christ walk down that street. Though we may be tempted to become frustrated when we see bad things happen in this world. And I know that I have said that I want Christ to come back right here and right now. That that's not dictated by me. That that's not chosen by me or any of us. I think that it hasn't happened because there's still so much more for us to do in this world. There's still so much more good that we as Christians, as followers, have to do in this world. We are called to be continuing to point towards that everlasting and loving God, showing others who it is that we are waiting on. One pastor named Hubert Beck said this on this passage. It is not the way we all are. The church has heard of the bridegroom's coming for 20 centuries and had, it has marked sign after sign after sign and listened to and believed promise after promise after promise. Still, he has not come. Does not a wondering set in? A wondering about whether Jesus really means to come at all or if we are simply victims of delusionary hope. Do we not grow weary and waiting and finally just drop off to sleep? Surely the Lord knows his people when he speaks this way of this, in this parable. But do his people know him? That is the question. Friends, like Paul, we are still living in a world that is broken. Paul desired, I'm sure of it, when he's sitting in that prison, that Christ would come back. And that Christ would make things new then. But we all know that that didn't happen. So what are we going to do in our own lives? We're waiting for Christ's return. And as much as we want it to come, we may not see it. We're called to be faithful to seeking that experience with Christ in this life and sharing this Christ with others. We have a wonderful opportunity this night to share the love of Christ with our brothers and sisters <coughs> in the same hospital that are going to come over and be with us. We have a church here that invites a lot of people through our doors each and every week, but this is one of the few opportunities when most of us will be together and able to do this work together. And that's exciting. And it brings a smile to my face knowing what we are going to do tonight. It is an exciting night 
because not only do we get to share really good food, because as we know, Methodists can cook really well, right? But we also get to share the love and grace that God has given to us. And ultimately, isn't that what this whole thing is all about? So since I haven't been offering up many suggestions of things that we can do with our acts of random kindness, I thought that I would take this opportunity to share one that I thought of this week with you all now. I think tonight the challenge for myself and what I might suggest to you is to take a chance to connect with someone new, whether they be a member in this church or one of our guests coming through the door that you don't know very well. <clears throat> we are waiting for Christ to come and take us to this paradise, but we're going to be all gathered together tonight. And Christ says that where one or more are gathered in my name, there I am. We can have paradise tonight. We don't have to wait for Christ to return because Christ is here in us. We're waiting for Christ to come back and take us to paradise, but when we're all gathered, Christ will be downstairs in that room. Friends, we will get to experience that paradise tonight. And so I encourage all of us to come and be together here. Paradise will invade our space downstairs, and we will be able to see lives made new because of the grace and love that Christ has given to us. That's exciting. That's good news. And I have to say, I'm excited to do that with you. So, friends, as we leave today, as we go about this meal tonight, let us take an opportunity to experience God moving in this space so that we can know what that feels like and then we can go and seek it out in our world too. Because Christ isn't just here. Christ won't be just where we are downstairs. But Christ is anywhere we choose to embody those Christian beliefs and to live fully in the grace that's already present in our hearts and the grace that's present in our friends, our neighbors, and those we don't know yet. Amen. Amen.